since this one, I'll start with, with you for, for you, George. We wanted to ask a few people today about this trend of a lot of people buying um, real estate in tall buildings and not really living in it, either um, in you know, Vancouver, New York, a lot of places this is pretty prevalent, um, where the high cost of land has made it um, easier to build tall luxury towers. And a lot of people are buying uh, these apartments, these condos, and not living in them. Should there be any sort of, or not living in them very often, should there be any sort of residency requirement or legislation of any kind or a special tax on this, or is this something the market uh, demands and, and will adjust for? Uh, I don't. I don't think you can enforce uh, anything like that in terms terms of legislation. I know that there have been uh, provisions put in place in sales agreements that uh, require uh, that are kind of anti-flipping uh, provisions that, don't, that so that they have to hold that property for a while. But nothing that r relates to residency. I mean, the issues of residency, especially in the in the Middle East and in, in Dubai area, is as a matter of getting people to live there, mm. and the only way to get people live there is to have professional services firms working there and business uh, generating work for people to live there instead of just have a, a holding on to uh, a, a house for uh, for leisure purposes or for investment purposes. But it is something you're seeing everywhere. A lot of it has to do with uh, uh, real estate being a way to have a safe haven for your money. You know, every time part of the world gets a bit um, dicey, uh, people will be selling units in Dubai or London or even Panama City. Uh, every time there's a problem in, in South America, uh, I have a client down in, uh, in Panama who sells a few more units. And, and so you know, that's certainly part of it, but it does certainly affect the local market and where it does tend to raise uh, real estate prices beyond the local demand. And that, 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 is, that is an issue, but it, it's, it's a world issue about having a safe haven, place, pla a place that people can um, can put some of their, their money in case uh, things don't go so well back home. Hmm. Yeah, real estate's always been a, yeah. a, an investment yeah. that most people would make. Um, for both of you, what do you think is the most under addressed topic in tall building design, research, development, um, something that's not being discussed in the right way or at the right you know, level um, that, that you think should be addressed? Well, I, I would like to see there a lot more, uh, let's say, documentation of, of, say, embodied carbon, okay? Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, I'll say even you know interesting architecture out there that is pretty inefficient, okay, and you know it's good to have good architecture, but I would hope there could also be good ar architecture which also is not 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 overly wa wasteful, and if there was more like uh, r r responsible uh, you know reporting responsibility for like embodied carbon that people, I think. Uh, I think you know, good designers are good designers are good designers. They can be quite clever with minimal material as well as maximum material. And I think something like that might be helpful. And it's something that's not really uh, uh, you know, reported that often. And th but the other thing is there's been a lot of disinformation. You know, what are good numbers for steel? What are good numbers for concrete, exterior wall, construction costs? Mm -hmm. you know, all these things. Y you know, there, there needs to be more of a more recognized industry standard that, that we can use to benchmark uh, buildings about you know, how responsible are they mm. as, as, you know, to, to the environment. So we've come a long way in getting energy efficiency and the end use, end user point, and yeah. even, you know, building use, but not embodied carbon yet. Yeah, because, you know, day one, most of your carbon is embodied. It's, in, in fact, mostly structure. And I see some very, very ambitious buildings out there, which I know must be amazingly expensive from a structural point of view, uh, and that doesn't really get talked about. Mm. And so I think it's something that should be talked about. Uh, it, I think uh, the topic that you have to look at, and uh, we, first of all, we, all, we know that any tall, tall building or even medium-rise building is built up of a series of components which are fairly basic. Even Burj Khalifa are all elements that you can buy for any, any tower around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, 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 any building system that you could think of should be addressed in a, in a bigger way. I mean, the big ones that come to mind are certainly vertical transportation. I know people are working on other systems, but nothing's really come out yet. Uh, I, I think some of the bigger advances, and Bill probably will talk about that more, is a, about how you e uh, evaluate the structures of, the, of, of a building and, and, and through uh, simulations and all that uh, get a more efficient structure. Mm -hmm. I think that those are big, big advances that are happening and that uh, certainly in our own, our own house at SOM, but 
but the uh, but e every building aspect. I mean, the, the enclosure, the the. Uh, I'm not. I'm an architect, so I'll be talking about more about those systems. The vertical transportation systems, certainly MEP systems, are always looking at new new ways now too. But I think that more and more uh, research has to go into materials and and, and the like mm -hmm. and systems. Is there a tall building project that you most admire, um, and what of that, what element of that would you like to see emulated more often, um, or alternatively, what's something about that project you would improve upon or change, if well, you have one? Well, I'll t you know, uh, so so we shouldn't name any of our own buildings, okay? <laughs> uh, but uh, Why let me, not? Uh, well, I'll talk about a building that uh, as our firm did that I wasn't involved in, which is the John Hancock mm -hmm. here in Chicago. You know, for me, it's just. Uh, it's it's hard to get better than that one. Okay, it, it has it, you know it, it speaks to its system. It's rational. Uh, it it's a, it's approachable. Uh, uh, a, a, a third grade child can make a sketch of you know they draw a couple lines, some X's, and you say, oh, it's the John Hancock. It, you know the idea is that simple and that clear. Uh, you know it, it's broad at the base where it's retail and office. It's narrow at the top where it's residential. I mean it's you know it's a multi-use uh, building. And so it's it's really a, in my mind, uh, you know, one of the best buildings ever done. I mean, I, I hate to sound redundant, but I, I agree with Bill 100%. That if anybody asks me what my favorite building is as an architect, it's always John Hancock. Mm -hmm. It has it has all all the things that uh, that appeal to me in terms of a, a structure itself, a piece of architecture, and how it sits into a city. And this is like one of the more important elements as we look at tall buildings around the world. Mm -hmm. Here's another topic we're asking a lot of people about today, and then we'll move on to some specific questions about the Cayenne Tower. Um, do you think wood will become a primary tall building material in 10 years' time uh, beyond the spare applications we've seen so far? I know SRM's done a lot of work on this. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, I, I just had a client conversation today about doing a tall uh, timber hmm. project. And so... Uh, Where is it? Uh, it's yet to be dis yet gotcha. to be announced. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, but yeah, I think it's something certainly to be explored and, and brought further. And, and you know, and, and but we need to invent some technologies that make it more appropriate for a tall tall building. A lot of the stuff I've seen uh, related to um, the the taller buildings that have been done so far are more like residential scale timber writ large. But the tall building problem is fundamentally different. Okay. And, and and the and the materials you're, that timber is going to be competing against are, are are primarily reinforced concrete for say uh, for uh, residential or steel and concrete for office, and so it needs to uh, have systems that are that it will be competitive with those systems so that the the quality of the space is not compromised and the costs are they. So I think there's going to be some uh, some needs for some new technologies to be validated and, and put into place, but I think it's going to happen pretty quickly. And I think in 10 years is not an unreasonable time frame to see, start seeing some some pretty big steps in timber construction. Mm. George, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not that close to to the subject, but uh, but you can see that uh, wood is a material that would be very advantageous from uh, uh, energy and uh, standpoint and sustain, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. But the and and I and I can see from afar that uh, that building um, material. Could be used right t today in in uh, in, l in low rise conditions all over. Um, in you see warehouse buildings built all over the city that are 10, 12 stories high that are primarily uh, the internal systems at least are are uh, wood uh, all wood systems. So I don't see a reason why that doesn't happen right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Except for code, I guess, is restrictive in a lot of cases. There's a lot of code issues that have to be, uh, and I think the code and the perception of wood in terms of fire are going to be one of the biggest issues that people have to overcome. Mm. So a communication aspect too, I guess, perception. Right. Mm. Um, so about the Cayenne uh, Tower specifically, um, the twisting form of it, can we talk about how exactly that impacts the wind loading and also the solar exposure? Uh, well, I'll talk about the wind. <clears throat> you, you know, we, we do know that w the term we like to use a lot is confusing the wind. Mm -hmm. And because if, if you have a, like a, a straight prismatic tower that's coming out, particularly like, uh, like the Cayenne Tower, which is right on the waterfront, uh, you know, you can get some very, very large wind forces just because the, uh, uh, you'll have these things called vortices. As the wind goes past, it'll curl on one side and the other, and it'll start to rock the building from side to side. And that can get very, very, very well organized um, uh, if you have a building that's straight up and down. Whereas if you have something like this with, with a bit of a, a twist to it, it confuses the wind because the where the place that the air the wind will separate from the t from the s from the building we call it the uh, flow separation will change on every floor, and there's been some pretty good research out of Japan uh, about different shapes and 
And uh, we did not test a purely straight one and a purely twisted one, but we've seen laboratory d uh, data on, on, on tests that have done that. It's about 25% reduction in the wind forces. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty substantial. It's not a linear relationship, though, is it? It's not like there's one amount of twist that is the perfect amount. It depends on the condition. And it's not as if the more twist, the better always? Uh, well, it, I, I, think, I, think that's, uh, I think there's a certain amount of, I won't say twist, but let's say a uh, certain amount of uh, change in the floor plate, mm -hmm. okay? That, 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 and this, we did asymmetry, on, we, I guess. We did this on Burge also, you know, where the floor plates kept setting back, you know, and, and you know, and, and, and so, so the more, but uh, within limit, uh, yeah, making the, the, the building, particularly in the top third, not the same, having it, having it change uh, is very beneficial. And, I, and, and, this not, and if you look at the data, this 90 degree twist is pretty, it's a pretty good number. It's pretty, you, you could do 180 twist, you could go all the way around again, uh, but uh, you, won't, you won't get that much more of a benefit. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Roughly what percentage um, reduction or benefit does it give you? Well, we, we were seeing about a 25%. 25%. Oh, that's what the research shows is about 25% yeah. reduction. And the solar exposure? And, as, and the solar is kind of interesting. It's very, it's very sim in a similar way because the, the solar uh, is pretty much straight straight on in from any one direction. And the building, because of its twist, presents a different uh, amount of area to that direct sunlight in every, every floor up on the, on the building. So it, in, in effect, it's self-shading in, in a way. It doesn't present, if you took a rectangular building and went all the way up, you'd get a full facade hitting the sun at any one point in time. It, but when you twist it, you get, you get a fraction of that uh, facade actually exposed to, to, to it. The other por portions of the, fraud, of, of the facade during the twist, actually, because it's on oblique, will shade, shade and some will be in full, full sun, some will be not in full shade. So mm. it, from that standpoint, it's self-shading without any kind of uh, architectural treatment on the outside. Generally, a building in the Middle East, done a lot of this, is there a shift going on where there's more attention to contextual forms, passive systems? You mentioned the form of the tower itself basically being the shading system, or is it still the paradigm which seemed to always be especially predominant in the Middle East that you kind of just overpower the climate with engineering? Oh, I've, I've never seen uh, anybody really totally overpower. Or attempt to. Or attempt to totally overpower uh, in the environment. But, uh, I mean, in Dubai, they've come out with uh, uh, codes, and so, so does all, all the other cities. So you'll see more and more of that passive uh, approach to, to doing buildings. Uh, I know we've, uh, we've practiced that for, you know, ever since I've been at SOM for over, mm -hmm. for over 40 years mm -hmm. now. So, so it's not anything new, and I, most, most architects probably think about that a bit. Sure. But in the early days of uh, the, uh, Dubai, I mean, there's a lot of glass buildings all, all over um, that don't take, pay attention to those kinds of things and try to overpower it with, uh, with the, uh, the material. Do you see a shift happening with clients and developers as well as architects? I, I see it happening with the architects first. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think the developers fully have embraced that yet, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they know they have to do it. And I think that if you show them the benefits of it o long term and educate them, uh, I think that they will uh, come along. Bill, thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, just to echo a lot of some of the stuff that George said, I mean, you, you could, even if you have a building that's glass, you can be, there's a lot of clever things one can do. It, you know, and, and you talk about overpowering. Uh, but uh, you can so sometimes you say uh, outsmarting it more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a very sophisticated uh, system that some somehow you're able to capture the the heat before it gets in or replace it w without necessarily going to mirror glass. I'm not talking about that. Uh, it's interesting. You know, George and I spent uh, years working on the Burj Khalifa. You know, uh, that 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 building it's glass, but it's got six sides. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's it, it, you know people. It's a hexagon. You think of it as a Y with three points, but it actually has six six sides. So no more than one sixth of the building could ever be into the sun, mm. okay? And then uh, and when you look at the Burj and you see how it sparkles in the, in, the, in, in the daylight, all that sparkle is sun that did not go into the building because of the stainless steel uh, million caps out there. Uh, you know, and so th there's a lot of clever ways that one can, you know, not out overpower but outsmart, <laughs> uh, sure. you know, the, the problem. Mm -hmm.